Now we look at some of the cross-cultural effects of this connection, of Anglo-American culture in Africa, of African culture in America. Like America, Sierra Leone's a nation of ethnic groups, tribes with their own languages, cultures, last names, limbas like President Joseph Momo, Mendes like Paramount Chief Coca. There are Timnes, Fulas, Locos, and others. But there's one group here that belongs to no tribe. Their last name's British. Well, we try to imbibe the British way of life because they trained us, they educated us. They're the Creoles, descendants of ex-slaves from England, the Caribbean, Africa, and America. Britain created Sierra Leone specifically for them. Though they're a minority of the population now, they're culturally the most influential. Each slaves or Nigerian come up. Their African dialect of English is the main language spoken here. Their Four Bay College, which has expanded to become the University of Sierra Leone, was for more than a century the only college in black Africa. One of the groups here is called the Nova Scotians. They're former American slaves who in some cases ran away from their plantations to fight with the British against George Washington. While an estimated 5,000 blacks fought on the American side, three times that many fought for the king because of proclamations like this one issued by Virginia's colonial governor John Dunmore. He declared slaves of rebels, quote, free that are willing to bear arms. After the British lost, they took the blacks with them, many to Nova Scotia in Canada, and nine years later, in 1792, thousands of the ex-slaves moved to Sierra Leone. They gave the capital its name, Freetown, and made this cotton tree the symbol of their freedom. It is a symbol of the city to this day, and ironically, the American embassy sits right in front of it. Joseph Jarrett Yasky runs an architectural company in Freetown. According to him, even though his ancestors were taken out of America, generations passed before America was taken out of them. I remember an old aunt of mine, and you don't know what she, you, when she talks to us, we couldn't understand whatever she was saying. Because she had an American accent. Yes. American accent, American twang, American everything. On the way, but the from the time Africans from places like Sierra Leone were brought here as slaves and for decades after slavery ended, the sea islands of South Carolina and Georgia remained unique in America. Places where blacks, called gullahs, were the majority and where much of their African culture survived. But as developers have moved in and gullahs have moved out, there's a concern that a culture may disappear. you remember, a history of a people has been hushed. Island's native Ron Days and his wife Natalie from New York have made preserving the Gullah culture their life's work. He's authored a book on Gullah folklore, and he and Natalie travel the East Coast with their Gullah show. Like how old Gullahs would handle a guest who overstayed his welcome. You said, I got an early morning tomorrow, and they're still sitting up in your house. But once you finally get rid of them, how can you make sure they never come back? Well, see, Islanders say, Dad, you just get some salt. You said, take that salt, you took them over your shoulder and they get them to go. And that face won't dock your doorway no more. Right. Though he does the show, Ron Day so said as a child, he was not allowed to speak Gullah in his home. My mother was a school teacher. So talking Gullah, broken English, brawling English, brawling speech, as it was referred to, was um, shunned in my home, but I always heard it. Uh, we were laughed at. Emery Campbell, director of St. Helena Island's Penn Center, says their Afro-English dialect was the source of such ridicule by outsiders, some Gullahs have tried to forget it. Oh yeah, a lot of people are still um, rejecting Gullah because Gullah was never accepted by our school system, uh, by mainstream society. Them Yankee, when them Yankee come down, they ain't know what them people say. The congressman from that area, Republican Arthur Ravnell, says Gullah's effects extended beyond the black community, that it may have been his first language. And there were very few uh, white kids in, in, in the community, and most of the folks that worked on the farm were black, and 
Most of them spoke, um, spoke Gullah, some degree of Gullah anyhow. So I just naturally spoke it back. I picked it up. He says so in Congress, if, uh, even he catches it. And uh, I've had people to say, what'd you say, Ravnell? What's that? I said, look here now. <clears throat> I didn't come out of Congress to give English lessons. But among those most vigilant in holding on to some of their African roots are the basket makers at the Charleston market. And my great-grandmother and my grandmother explained that this is something that we should not let go. It's something that we are presently fighting to keep our young people, to enforce it in our young people to keep the art alive because it's one of the only thing actually that linked us from the country that we came from. Our final link tonight, a little ditty, a collection of words passed down in a family from generation to generation long after the words had lost all meaning. And then one day, suddenly, the song had all the meaning in the world. A Muslim funeral song in the language of Sierra Leone's largest tribe, the Mindys. The voice, that of Amelia Dolly, who's now buried in this Gullah Cemetery in Harris Neck, Georgia. But 60 years ago, Dolly, at the age of 50, recorded her song for linguist and former Howard University professor Lorenzo Turner. Turner was traveling throughout the Sea Islands of Georgia and South Carolina, documenting links between the Gullahs and Africa. His book on the subject included Amelia Dolly's Mende song with the English translation. Which means everybody come. Uh, the grave is not yet finished. Joe uh, Opala is an American who teaches anthropology at the University uh, of Sierra Leone. After reading Turner's book, he set out to find Mindy's who knew the song. At Jimmy Bogbo Village, 200 miles from the capital, he found it. <laughs> Though time had changed some of the words in the tune, it described the same events and had the same message as the one sang in America by Amelia Dahl. It's clearly the Mendes song. Uh, we don't know how many generations it's passed down, but uh, certainly for about uh, 200 uh, to 250 years. About the same time Opala was searching, a group of American Gullahs was visiting Sierra Leone and heard about the song. One of them, Loretta Sams, was from Georgia. To go to Sierra Leone and then hear that there's a song that's been sung since 1931 that you never knew anything about. So when I came back home, I decided I was going to find were there any descendants of the Dolly family? Well, she did. Here lives the Moran family, Mary Moran, who is a daughter of Amelia Dolly, and she knows the song. I walk on my morning, She remembered the day her mother left home to record the song. She said neither of them understood the words. Well, she said her grandmother taught it to her, and she taught it to me. And uh, I just thought it was nothing but a little, I danced by the song because I didn't know what it was all about. Mm -hmm. The first time I knew what this song really meant was when Joe came and told us it was a funeral procession hymn. Uh -huh. How did you feel at that point? Well, I was struck. It, it really shocked me. Yeah. Moran has ten children and dozens of grands, and many of them came over to see the tape we'd shot of the African women singing the song, and of Joe Opala explaining to the Mendes that an American woman could sing in their language. We meet one old granny, black American, African American, old granny. Name Mary Moran. Mary Moran, 69 years old, says she'd like to visit the village someday, but even if she doesn't, the song will live on because she's taught it to her seven-year-old granddaughter, Kita. The Moran family of Harris Neck, Georgia. These stories were originally broadcast on News 7 during February, Black History Month.
And we should note that this African-American connection has been a big part of the Smithsonian's Black History effort. Right now, here at the Museum of African Art, on display are photographs of Sierra Leone's Paramount Chiefs. The display will continue through the summer. We're going to leave you today with more scenes of Sierra Leone, pictures that we took when we were there in January. For all of us at News 7, I'm Sam Ford. Thank you and good night.